Hello, everyone. Hello, 11.30. Hello, everyone on the live stream. I'm just going to create a bit of space. Hold on. Hmm. Over 25 years ago, on the 12th of April, 1998, I took a step of faith. As a 15-year-old teenager, I made the decision to publicly declare that I put my hope, my trust, my faith, and my life into the hands of a person called Jesus. I dared to believe that God existed and that the God I believed in was a God of love. I remember standing up in front of a group of young people to share the reason why I'd made this decision to follow Jesus. And absolutely petrified, I can't really remember anything I said except for God is love and Jesus is my friend. It was a very long time ago and I was only 15. It wasn't profound or eloquent, but it was me. And I experienced such a deep sense of God's love that after I got baptised, filled with the Holy Spirit, I found that I had an ability to talk about Jesus and about my faith with a courage, confidence and conviction that I'd never had before in my life because I had grown up such a shy child. I think I actually didn't say many words for the first eight years of my life. And my parents probably thought there was something wrong with this child. But looking back now at that definitive moment over 25 years ago, I know that the day I decided to put my hope and my life in the hands of Jesus, that was the day I began a journey to discover who I was and why I'm here. And that's been a journey I've been on for many, many years with Jesus. In the past 25 years, I've been in so many situations where I've had to choose, do I follow the world's values or will I follow Jesus' values? I've lived in different cities, I've lived in different cultures and every single day it's like you reach a fork in the road and you have to make a choice. Will I live by the world's values and priorities? Or will I choose to follow Jesus? Will I choose to think about what Jesus values? And will I live out his kingdom culture? And that has been a journey I've been on for over 25 years. Every day, I particularly remember in the workplace, I face decisions like, am I gonna be encouraging or am I gonna be mean? Am I gonna help people or am I gonna tear people down? And I'm gonna, am I gonna look after the people around me or am I gonna use and manipulate people to get what I want from them? Am I gonna be kind or will I be harsh? Am I gonna hold a grudge or can I forgive? Will I cut corners to make money or will I do the right thing even if it's gonna cost me personally? And it means that I'm not gonna get promoted. These are the kind of decisions that I faced and I know many of you face in your day-to-day -day lives. Over the past 25 years, there are times where I've got it right and there are times where I've got it so wrong. I know life isn't easy and it's not clear cut or straightforward. And I wanna encourage you today, if you're facing a particular challenge, battle, trial or temptation, I wanna to say to you that God's love and grace is completely unconditional and totally accessible to you right now. God does not leave you in the darkest times of your life. That has certainly been my experience over the past 25 years. And actually it's in the darkest seasons that I've experienced God with me in a way which I find it hard to describe with words. And one of the hardest yet greatest lessons I've had to learn over and over and over again is that our Christian faith and identity 
is not actually about our great love for God, but it's actually about God's great love for us. The theologian Tim Keller says this, a Christian identity is based ultimately on the realisation of God's unchanging love for us. God loves you unconditionally, wholeheartedly, and absolutely continuously. The same love I experienced when I'm 15, I know I'll continue to experience to, to the day when I meet him face to face. John Stott wrote an entire commentary on the Sermon on the Mount. And this is the sermon series we're currently in, where we unpack a little bit of Jesus' ultimate teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. And John Stott says that the teaching of Jesus in this sermon is as close as you can get to a kind of manifesto from Jesus, of what Jesus longs for his followers to look like and to be like. And if John Stott could summarise the Sermon on the Mount in two words, which is pretty impressive, he would use the words Christian counterculture. Those are the two words he would use. And he writes this, for too often what we see in the church is not counterculture, but conformism. As the church is conformed to the world, the church is contradicting its true identity. The essential theme of the whole Bible from the beginning to the end is that God's historical purpose is to call out a people for himself. And that this people is a holy people set apart from the world to belong to him and to obey him. And that its vocation, your vocation, is to be true to your identity. That it is to be different in all its outlook and behaviour. When you know who you are, when you know your identity as a much-loved child of God, that releases you to lead a radically distinctive life. Do you know why you're here and do you know who you are? In Matthew 5, verses 13 to 16, we read this. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavours of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colours in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. And by opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. In this passage, Jesus is speaking three truths over his people. And he paints three pictures so that we might understand what he's trying to say. And Jesus uses salt and light, two very, very common household items in those times. Every household, no matter how poor, would have had both salt and light. And he uses these as pictures, as illustrations to try to make his point. It's almost as if Jesus is longing for his people to understand who they are. It's not so much what you do, it's who God has called you to be. You belong to him and not to this world. And Jesus says three things to his people. He says, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world, and you are a city on a hill. This is who you are. And he uses these images to basically say, you are to be a force for good. You are to use your influence to have a positive impact on the environment around you and the world. And it all flows out of this deep, deep experience and understanding of God's love. 
when we look at this teaching, it was pretty radical, disruptive, and revolutionary over 2,000 years ago. And I still think that it's pretty radical, disruptive, and revolutionary in 2024 for us right now. In each of these pictures, there's both an affirmation and a corresponding condition. So Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. So let's start with salt. I personally love salt. And um, I actually need to watch my salt intake because I eat so much instant ramen and I eat a lot of crisps. So I need to be careful with salt, but I do love salt. But in ancient times, salt wasn't just a seasoning or a flavoring. Salt was a preservative. And it's because um, they just didn't have fridges back then. So the only way you could, um, let's say, make meat last longer is that you'd put salt on meat to preserve it because salt would slow down decay. And that is what Jesus is saying. You are salt. You slow down things that are going bad around you. You change the environment. You make things taste better. Eugene Peterson says that you bring out the God flavours in the world. And you've probably heard this phrase, salt of the earth, because I definitely heard this phrase growing up. And when someone said, oh, he's the salt of the earth kind of person, you knew exactly what they meant. Now, when I talk to my sister on the phone, which I do often, we don't use the word salt of the earth so much because it's a little bit dated. But what we say is we say, he is a good egg. He's a good egg. When we talk and we chat, we say, he's such a good egg. I want that guy on my team. Because we all kind of know what a good egg is. And a good egg isn't so much known for their gifting. A good egg is known for their character. That's what it means to be a good egg. Jemima Haley, she is a good egg. And both me and my sister agree on that. So that's the affirmation. You are the salt of the earth. But what is the condition? Well, salt has to stay salty in order to be effective. If you lose your saltiness, then you've lost your purpose. And salt was a material that was traded as a form of currency back in those days. And in Jesus' time, there were salt traders who knew that if they filled salt with other things, they could make more money. I mean, there were dodgy shenanigans going on even 2,000 years ago. But when salt is diluted, when it's filled with other powders and fillers, it loses its distinctive flavour and it loses its important properties. I mean, you wouldn't mix salt. And I've got some regular table salts here. You wouldn't mix salt with, say, talcum powder. I mean, it, it is all white powder at the end. So on the outside, it looks the same, I guess. But I know I wouldn't cook my dinner tonight and add anything like this in my frying pan. I think the point is that life is complicated and confusing. And it's really easy to forget who you are and why you're here. It's easy to get sucked up into the world's value system and priorities. And I actually think that it's quite easy to live a pretty self selfish life in London. It's not hard. I wake up on Saturday morning and everything around me tells me, buy that thing and make yourself look good. It's, you, it's just it's everywhere. You, you, you turn on the Instagrams, you turn on the Netflix, and everything is like, yeah, you just do you. Do what feels right for you. You have to think about anyone else. And when you get mixed up and muddled up, it's like putting salt and talcum powder together. When you're not shaped and rooted in the values and person of Jesus, who Jesus says that you are, life can be extremely confusing. 
that's when you're at risk of losing your distinctive flavour. And I think one of the questions I wrestle with is how much time I spend investing in things of Jesus and his kingdom versus how much time I spend investing in things which I'm not really sure are going to actually do any good. Don't conform, but be transformed and stay salty. Be salt. Secondly, you are the light of the world. When I was um, researching this passage, I, maybe it was only me, but the more I read into it, I realised that in Jesus' time, people didn't use candles. So um, the, like Jesus didn't really use something like this 2,000 years ago. What I realised is that Jesus used um, oil lamps. So I went to John Lewis and I said to the very nice man at the counter, do you have any paraffin oil lamps? And he looked at me and was like confused. He said, oh, maybe go to the website. Go to the website. So I was like, okay. But anyhow, I went on the interwebs and I found this. It's not exactly the same, but in those days, they probably would have had a bowl and they would have filled the bowl with oil. But I bought this online I'm going to put it here. And um, when it arrived, I had to assemble it because it didn't come like this. There was, a, there was a jar of a bottle of oil and there was a wick and then there was this contraption. And um, what you need to do is you, you fill the oil in the lamp. And so in those days, they probably would have filled the oil into a bowl. And then there was a wick, a piece of string. And then you would put the wick in the oil and then you'd have to wait and I had to wait 30 minutes for the oil to soak into the string and then you light it a bit like this and hopefully it's going to work and I think it's working so the string is filled with oil and now it's and now it's burning and um when I look at the lamp, I was kind of like, oh, this is really interesting. It's different to a candle. But the string, once it's saturated in the oil, can burn for a really long time. Because actually, it's not the string burning. It's the oil that's burning. And in order to shine a light, in order to be light in the darkness, it's really not about the string. It's about the oil. And so in order to shine brightly for Jesus, I think what we need to do is spend time as a piece of string saturated in God's presence, investing in our most important relationship with Jesus. That's the only way you're ever going to shine in darkness. And the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit does is the Holy Spirit ignites the flame and the thing starts to burn. And when you're filled with God's Spirit and you start to burn, you discover there are things within you that you didn't even know were there. After I got baptised over 25 years ago, um, we had an opportunity to almost share what God had spoken to us as we got baptised. And there was a mic and anyone could go up. And I remember going up to share what I felt God had given me. And I honestly can't remember anything I said but I know it probably wasn't very eloquent or profound. But I remember there was a boy who came up to me afterwards and he said, wow, you're on fire for God. And I looked at him totally confused, partially because I couldn't even remember anything I said. But I still felt like a really ordinary 15-year-old teenager. And I don't think, I still felt inside the same person but I know that when you're filled with the Spirit, it's almost like something takes over. And actually, in the past 25 years, I've never stopped feeling very ordinary, very inadequate, very weak, and very human. You know, the world around us tells us you need to earn your identity. You need to perform, and you need to achieve, and you need to behave. And that's how you prove to the world that you're worth something. But the thing is, when you give your life to Jesus, he gives you your identity. That's a received identity, and that's a completely different thing. Because your life stops being about what you do, and your life starts to be all about, this is what God has done for me. And when you receive that identity, you start to move in a completely different way. You may feel anxiety, 
You know, every day you can be so in your head with your thoughts. But when I spend time and I remember to be still and know that he is God, something starts to shift. Something starts to shift. His peace starts to be poured in. And those anxious thoughts can kind of be surrendered because I know that I am loved. I know I'm loved and I can't lose it. I mean, the pressure's off people. We can just be ourselves, ordinary people who worship an extraordinary God. Filled with his spirit, God empowers ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Actually filled with his spirit, God enables us to do small things and then he does all the heavy lifting. In day-to-day life, all you have to do is take a step of faith and do an ordinary thing and say, Jesus, I wanna do this for you and then watch what God does because he always does it. It's all him and not so much us. All we have to do is make ourselves available to God. Here I am, Lord, use me. God has always called his people from Old Testament to New Testament to be light in the world, to not only be a light in the darkness, exposing the evil around us, but to be a light for people walking in darkness who are lost and confused. That's why we run Alpha here every single term. Not because we actually like putting on events, but because we long for people who don't yet know Jesus to come into a relationship with him. I know that having a relationship with Jesus changed my life and it's still changing my life even now. And you know, there are people in London, in a city of 8 million people, people walk in darkness every day, confused and lost. Do we dare to share the reason for the hope that we have? And then there's the work that we do in our social transformation ministries. That's why we run a homeless shelter midweek. That's why at Wormwood Scrubs Prison, in this borough, there's a team of people running Alpha and running services to declare hope and light for people walking in dark times. This is how we slow down the social decay going on in our society because we still believe in the transformation of society that's possible with Jesus. It all starts with Jesus. We want to bring light and hope for those having a hard time. We long to point people to the true light of the world, Jesus, through our words and our actions. And often they're small words and small actions. I wonder how many of us live our lives surrounded with people who don't yet know Jesus and we feel this fear. Can I tell this person about the reason for the hope that I have? Can I really be honest with why I haven't completely lost my mind over the past couple of years? I don't really know how people do life without Jesus, but I know that I can't do life without Jesus. When we let our light shine, so that others may see our deeds, our countercultural behaviour. This may cause people to glorify God and bring praise to our Father in heaven because all glory belongs to God. So you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world, and you are a city on a hill. In ancient times, cities weren't built on hills. They were actually built at the base of a hill or in a valley. But if you did build a city on a hill, the light and the lamps from that hill would illuminate for miles and miles and miles in the ancient world. I think Jesus is calling his church to be a Christian counterculture in 2024. He's calling us at HTB to live radically differently because of him. And the only way that we can live our lives in this way is to experience his love, to be filled by his spirit and empowered to move out in the opposite spirit to the narrative we receive every single day. We're meant to stand out and not blend in. Don't 
conform, but be transformed. The city on a hill is a community, but the church is not a club. The church is a new humanity. The people of God are a new humanity which God has created and gathered and united around the person of Jesus. There's a part that we play individually in our day-to-day lives, trying to be hope, salt, and light. But I think there's a part to play even within this community. And that's why the relationships here really matter. The way we do life with one another really matters. And Tim Keller says this, as a group, the way the races get along in church, the different classes get along in church, the way we do our business, the way we conduct our professional life, the way we involve ourselves in the arts and creativity, the way we do relationships, family life and business, all under the Lordship of Christ, shows the world who Jesus really is. You know, in the early church, the surrounding culture couldn't figure out how such a diverse and random group of people gathered. There were male and female. There were slave and free. There's Jew and Gentile. There's every nation, every tribe gathered all around the person of Jesus. And the surrounding culture were completely perplexed because they were like, what could unite such a diverse group. But there Jesus is. When the Jesus is at the centre of his church, he brings together different people from different walks of life, so much so that the surrounding culture can't figure it out. And Jesus promises that where he is lifted up, he will attract all people to him. So HTB, it's never going to get boring even if all we do is continue to lift Jesus up over and over and over again. In our worship, Jesus gets lifted up. In our prayers, Jesus gets lifted up. In the Word, Scripture lifts the name of Jesus up. And if all we ever do is lift the name of Jesus up, that will be a life worth lived. After 25 years of following Jesus, There is no regrets. The best decision I ever made in my life was to give my life to Jesus. It has been an adventure ever since. The world's problems are so big. They feel so big right now. And I feel so small. Will anything I do make any difference at all? When I started praying at the start of the year, I was praying and thinking about what 2024 was going to be like. And my sense was, wow, there's still a lot of disruption and a lot of change in our worlds. And all of this disruption and change is making people feel anxious, unsettled, overwhelmed, and lost, confused. And it's during times of great upheaval in our worlds the natural human inclination is to withdraw and self-preserve because that's just human. But the people of God who have followed Jesus historically over thousands and thousands and thousands of years have moved in the opposite spirit. They've chosen to be salt and light in the darkest of times. They have moved into neighbourhoods and communities where there is poverty, despair and hopelessness. And they've chosen to be salt and light in those places. They've poured their lives out and that is what salt and light is all about because as you pour yourself out, as salt is used, as the oil is burnt up, there's a giving away of yourself and there Jesus is with us. He's promised his presence as we go into the world and lift his name up season by season chapter by chapter. Nothing is unknown by God. As I started the year, I I was praying. And as I thought about it, I was like, you know what? The most radical and disruptive thing that's ever happened in human history has already happened. Because when Jesus entered into this world, he changed everything. 
His death on the cross was so revolutionary. The change that needed to happen, the disruption that needed to happen, happened there on the cross. And that sacrifice, that pouring out, redefined our past, present and future. Your hope is secure. You don't need to worry. Where your heart is, there your treasure is. My heart is with Jesus. I don't regret giving my heart to Jesus. And I've spent 25 years giving my heart back to Jesus over and over and over again. Jesus disturbs the comfortable and he comforts the disturbed. When Jesus gave this teaching, the Sermon on the Mount, he gave it to a small minority group of peasants. They were probably quite messy and broken. They had real lives and they had real problems. But Jesus spoke over them. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You are a city on a hill. Don't conform, but be transformed. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.